Hello everybody and welcome to our first exercise where we're going to look at how to perform tests on the equality across multiple population proportions. So this is going to be building on a fair bit of what we've already looked at in previous modules. Going back to module 10 where we really looked at the, the first test uh, for how to test for equality across two population proportions. And maybe you recall that was a I'll call it now a relatively straightforward uh, z-test when you are comparing two population proportions. Now we're into multiple population proportions, so the nature of this test changes. If you watched the introductory video to this module, well, you saw how now we are going to be using essentially an upper tail chi-squared test to determine whether or not we have evidence to show um, if there's a difference across our multiple population proportions. So let's get into this exercise and you will see as we go through this process how the foundation of this methodology is really comparing the observed proportions from our samples with what we would expect those proportions to be in the event that the null hypothesis is true. So what is that null hypothesis? Well, that's part A, that's the first step of our problem. So let's get through uh, this exercise. So as part of an undergraduate research project, you decide to determine whether pet owners are satisfied with their choice of pets. In order to gather sample data, you develop a survey, to ask respondents what type of pet they have. So we're looking at people who have dogs, cats, or other. I don't know if you can hear there's construction going on nearby. You might be able to hear the beep, beep, beep of somebody reversing right now. That's the distraction. So they have either a dog, a cat, or something else, and whether or not they're likely to adopt the same pet upon its death or a different one. So you have a cat, do you like having a cat? Are you likely to re-adopt uh, another cat or another dog or something? The following table contains the observed frequencies. Okay, so here's what we observe from those that we sampled. So we sampled 79 people who have cats. Are they likely to re-adopt another cat? We have 48 said yes and 31 said no. So those are the observed frequencies for each of these three different types of pets. So what, what we need to do now is, well, first of all, we'll develop our test. And then based on that null hypothesis, we will develop or calculate what we expect those frequencies to be. So our null and alternative, well, these are relatively straightforward, but at first it might not be what you expect. So the null hypotheses, well, here we can see in that problem, we're testing for the equality across proportion. So I would say, well, the proportion of cat owners likely to readopt is the same as the proportion of dog owners likely to readopt, and that's the same as the proportion of others likely to readopt. The alternative hypotheses, this is where it's easy to make little mistakes because every test that you've seen so far, when you see those equalities in the null hypotheses, your instinct, because it's consistent with everything that you've done, your instinct is going to be to put in those inequalities. Again, because that's what all of the other tests have looked like. When you see the equalities in the null, you automatically, you want to put these inequalities in the alternative. That doesn't work anymore. That's not what we're testing for. It might be the outcome, but we're not there yet. What we're testing for at first is to determine whether or not at least one is different, or you could say not all are, are equal. So here I'm gonna say at least one proportion is different. So of course that then begs the question of, you know, if we do reject the null hypothesis, and so our evidence supports the statement that at least one of those proportions is different, well, naturally you're gonna to wanna to ask, well, which one is different? Or which ones? Maybe they are all different. Maybe only one of them is different. Well, you can see here, 
if appropriate, use the Marasquillo procedure to determine where any difference exists. So if we reject the null hypotheses, we have evidence to show that at least one is different. Well, then we get into that next stage in the analysis to determine where the difference exists. So we're not quite there yet. For now, here we have our null and alternative set up. The null is that they are all the same. The alternative is simply that at least one is different. Now, if the null is true, because again, this is, this is really what gives us the foundation for our methodological approach and how we are going to perform this test. If the null is different, then those proportions, the proportion of cat owners, dog owners, other, they would all be the same. They would all be equal to some common proportion. Now, again, I'm not adding a fourth. I'm just saying that if they're all the same, I don't need the subscript. They're all the same. They're all some common proportion. So in order to develop our expected proportions, we need a point estimate of that common value of that common proportion. So how do we get that point estimate? Well, here I can see, in total, we surveyed 268 people. So that's just adding up 79 plus 77 plus 112. And out of those 268, 143 said yes, they would readopt. So if I calculate that as a proportion, 143 out of 268, well, that gives me a proportion of 0.534. So 53.4% of those surveyed, regardless of what type of pet, because again, we're treating them all as the same if the null is true. We treat them all as the same. So 53.4% would say yes. And so that's what we would expect. If the null is true, that's the same proportion that we would expect for cat owners, dog owners, and others. And similarly for the no response, 125 or 1 minus 0.534 would say no. And so that gives me a proportion of 0.466. And again, that's the common proportion if the null were true. And there's no difference across all of those different pet owners. So our next step here is to compute the expected frequencies. What we're building up here is our test statistic, right? Our test statistic is this chi-squared value where we are looking at the difference between our observed frequencies and our expected frequencies. So again, if those differences are very similar, in other words, if what we observe is very close, that difference is very close to what we expect, well, then those numbers are going to be small. That chi-squared statistic is going to be small. But if those numbers are large, if there's a great difference between what we observe compared to what we expect, if the null is true, if those are large, well, then when we square a large number, we get an even larger number, and that gives us a large chi-squared value. This is why this is an upper tail chi-squared test, because that chi-square statistic, it will be large. It will lie in the upper tail of the distribution only when these differences between what we observe and what we would expect to observe, only when those differences are large, that chi-square statistic will lie in the upper tail of the chi-square distribution. So, one last step here, we also will divide those by those expected, uh, expected frequencies. So what we need to do as that first step, and this is where these types of problems can be very tedious because in order to calculate this test statistic, there's a number of intermediate steps.
the first that I need to do are calculate those expected values. And all that requires is taking these proportions that we would expect if the null were true and applying it to those samples. So if the null is true and if there's no difference between the proportion of cat, dog, or other pet owners likely to readopt, of those 79, oops, of those 79 cat owners, I would expect, I'll write this in real small here, 53.4 or 0.534 of those 79. So 0.534 times 79, I would have expected 42. Point nineteen to have said yes. Applying that common proportion, if the null were true, of 53.4%, applying that to the cat owners, I would have expected 42.19 to have said yes. If I apply that same value to the dog owners, 0.534 times 77, well, if the null is true, I would expect 41.12 to have said yes. And again to others, so I'm applying the same proportion, 0.534 times 112. Here I would expect 59.81 to have said yes. Now. We go through the next row and I'm going to look at the no. So here all I'm doing now is I'm applying that value. Again, if the null is true, we'd have the same proportions across all different types of pet owners. So 0.466 times 79. 0.466 times 79. That gives me, I know this is very small, 36. 81. Which is also, of course, if I have 79 that I surveyed and I expected 42.19 to say yes, well, 79 minus 42.19, well, wouldn't you know it, is 36.81. So there's different ways that you could go about these calculations. Certainly, there's no one way that is better than another, so you can use whichever way is faster for you or is easier for you. Applying again that same value to the dog owners, I have 0.466 times 77. So that gives me here 35.88. And applying that same percentage, 0.466 to other, 112. That gives me here 52.19. So those are our expected values. Now, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna calculate a few different rows as we build up for this test statistic. So I'll first calculate those differences. Then I'll calculate those differences and square them. I'm going to give myself a little bit more space here. We'll calculate those differences. Then we will square those differences. Then, oops, then we will divide those differences, those squared differences, by those expected values. So, once we have those, then we are going to add those up, and somewhere down here will be our final chi-squared test statistic. Okay, so first things first, my observed value. I'm going to go through the yes row first. So what I observed was 48. What I expected, if the null is true, is 42.19. So 48 minus 42.19, well that gives me 
5.81. Now I'm going to complete this whole row while I've got the numbers already on my calculator. So if I'm going to square that, 33.76. And then I'm going to divide that by that expected value, 42.19. And that gives me, let me just, I don't need that line so large. So then that gives me 0.8. Okay. Now if we go through the next one, so I'm on dog. So that's 51 minus 41.12. 51 minus 41.12. That gives me 988 squared. 97.61 divided by that expected value, and that gives me 2.37. Okay, fast forward. I know you don't wanna watch every one of these. Feel free to fast forward all of these calculations. The next one, we'll go do the same thing, 44 minus 59.81. Whoops, what happened there? Oh yeah, that's fine, 44 minus 59.81, so that's minus 15.81 squared, 249.96, divided by 59.81, 4.18. Okay, now I'm into the no column, and you'll see something very, very similar here, and if you see the, the, the pattern, then it can actually help speed up your calculations a little bit. So the next one, again, I'm doing the observed. So here's 31 minus the expected, 3681. So 31 minus 36.81. And what do we see? It's minus 581. So it's really the same in absolute value as the very first one that we saw. So I square that, and of course that's going to be exactly the same. But now I'm dividing by the expected value, and that expected value changes right here. The first one I divided by 42.19, but now I'm going to divide that by 36.81, and so that gives me, oops, that gives me here zero point nine two next one I'm on the, the, the dog this is 26 minus 3588 and again we see a similarity here this is minus 988 same as what I had here so of course when I square that that's going to give me the same value 9761 divide by that expected. So that's this value up here, 35.88, 2.72. Last one, I'm almost out of room, 68 minus 52.19. I get the same value, 1581 squared 249.96 divide by the expected which is 52.19 and finally 4.79 I told you it was going to be tedious and we only have a few more problems like this and all of module 12 consists of these types of calculations in fact the, the goodness of fit problems, I'm sorry to say, are even worse than this. We'll get through them. Okay, so I'm going to add all of these up to give me my chi-squared test statistics. So 0.8 plus 2.37 plus 418 plus 0.92 plus 2.72 plus 0.9 gives me a chi-squared of 15.78. Remember that 
test statistic for your two population test on variance, that nice simple F test statistic, the ratio of two sample variances, boy, doesn't that feel simple now. <laughs> So after all of that, we've got our test statistic. Now, what do we do with it? Well, thankfully, the rest of this is, is the same. So we need to know our particular variant of the chi-square distribution that we're using. Here, we have three different categories, cat, dog, and other. Our degrees of freedom for this test is just k minus one, where k is the number of categories that we're looking at. So here I have three minus one. I have a chi-square distribution of just two degrees of freedom. And our test statistic is 15.78. So if we come down to our chi-square tables, two degrees of freedom, our test statistic is 15.78. Well, it's way off the charts here. I can see that 15, well, it's somewhere, it's somewhere it's larger than the largest value that I have on our table. So when we're looking at this chi-square distribution, remember it's some asymmetric distribution, and somewhere here I have this value of 10, 0.597 and that corresponds to a value in the upper tail of 0 0.005. Now again you know this is one of these really easy mistakes to make where when you look at this problem you see oh this is a, a test on equality everything up until this point when you see test for equality oh I've got to multiply probabilities by two or I've got to divide alpha by two to get the critical value that does not apply anymore yes it's a test for equality but the methodology that we're using here is an upper tail chi-squared test why an upper tail well because we want to know whether or not we have evidence to show that the differences between what we observe and what we would expect to see if the null is true, we want to see if those differences are large. Does that test statistic, is it large, not small? Is it a large difference? If it's a small difference, that supports the null. That supports this assumption that is embedded in our calculations. But if those differences are large, that test statistic will be large. It will lie in the upper tail of the distribution. So here's our chi-squared distribution, two degrees of freedom. Probably actually looks nothing like this, but that's fine. I don't need to be accurate in my drawing. So there's the largest value that we have in the table. The value in the upper tail, the probability in the upper tail is 0 0.005. Our test statistic is 15.78, which means it's out here somewhere which means that the probability in the upper tail here, our p-value, is going to be something less than 0 0.005. Now, if we also wanted to use the critical value approach, well, here we're doing this test at the 5% level of significance. And again, yes, this looks like a two-tail test with those equalities there, but it's not. It's an upper tail test. So we don't need to do uh, any changes to that level of significance. We don't have to divide it by two, which is what you might want to do when you see those equalities. So we would look down here. I see, okay, there's 0.05. There's chi-squared with two degrees of freedom. So here's that critical value, 5991. We would reject for any test statistic greater than or equal to and we do not reject for anything less than. So again, using the p-value approach, which we see here, that p-value is less than 0 0.005, and using the critical value approach, where I see that test statistic is well into that rejection space, both of these, both of these approaches, as always, they're consistent. We have evidence here 
to reject the null hypothesis. So we have very strong evidence, in fact, because that p-value is so strong, so small, we have a very strong evidence to support the alternative, which means that at least one of the proportions here is different. So what does that mean? How would we go about interpreting our conclusion? Well, when we look at the owners of cats, dogs, or other pets, we have evidence to show that the proportion of owners likely to readopt that same animal, at least one of those different pet owners is different than the other. The proportion of pet owners likely to readopt is different when we compare cat owners, dog owners, and others, other animals, whatever they are, iguanas or birds or fish. Okay, so now that we have evidence to show that at least one is different, we don't know yet which. So the next step, if appropriate, which here we have found that it is appropriate. So it is appropriate. Use the Marisquilo procedure to determine where any difference exists. That is what we will do next, and that is what I will do in my next video, because this video has gone a little long, which is fine. It's our first exercise of this type. I'll do a, sep a separate video for that Marisquilo procedure, and we'll figure out where the difference is. Okay, thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.